Baroness Gardner of Parks. My Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order. My Lords, under regulations made in 1986, most new heavy goods vehicles, HGVs, are required to be fitted with side guards. There are limited historical exemptions which were put in place for good reasons, for example, a motor vehicle not exceeding 15 mph and fire engines. Work is focused on amending regulations to ensure where side guards are required on new HGVs, these are re retained and maintained. I anticipate these proposals will be published in 2019. The Minister may be aware that the typical cases at the moment are the mixers and the tippers, and these are heavy goods lorries that do not, they are exempt. And it's the front wheel that hits you if you're a bicycle and too near, but it's when you get dragged under the vehicle that the back wheel is the one that kills you. And so it is really, I think, better to abolish this um, exemption, and particularly as companies like, such as Semex, the Mexican cement mixing firm, they have deliberately and carefully themselves put these barriers on, although they're not required. And they're trying to persuade other cement people to do it. But wouldn't it be simpler and better for the government to just change the regulations? And is the minister able to tell us figures for fatalities and casualties? Uh, well, I'm grateful to my uh, noble friend. Uh, cement mixers are not exempt under the uh, regulations. And since 2012, all tippers have had to be fitted with side guards. Uh, on, on the figures, uh, in London over the last three years, 70% uh, of cyclist fatalities uh, involved HGVs. So my noble friend is quite right to draw attention to this. Um, speaking as someone who came in on a cycle, um, my noble friend asks ab about, uh, about injuries. Um, of, the, of the cycle fatalities and life-changing injuries, uh, there are 29 in two years, 25 were caused by the cyclist being knocked over by the front of the cab or the side of the cab, in other words, ahead of the side guard. Once the cyclist is knocked over, uh, the side guards are of no value because they're two feet above the, 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 the ground. And so the government has been focusing on other measures to improve vision, improve cyclist safety, as well as making sure the existing regulations about side guards are honoured. We have an increasing number of uh, foreign vehicles, some of them uh, not uh, EU ones, on our city streets uh, these days, uh, with drivers that are driving often what's to them a strange side of the road. How confident is the government that those foreign vehicles meet the standards and regulations that we uh, require on side guards? The, um, the standards that we follow on side guards are international standards um, imposed under, in fact, one of the United Nations uh, subcommittees. So a vehicle, wherever it has been constructed, will have to meet those international standards, which, uh, which cover um, side guards. Um, we are now taking extra steps to make sure that, in addition to the vehicle being fitted with side guards when they are manufactured, the side guards are maintained if, for example, they become damaged. Quite often they're not replaced. And that is the regulations that we're looking at uh, bringing in, in next year. Um, could the Minister explain to the House <coughs> How much enforcement of these regulations takes place? Because um, I was kindly invited to a demonstration of enforcement down by the Tate Gallery a couple of years ago, where the police and VOSA um, were combining to enforce the regulations on tachograph and all other rules relating to trucks. And, um, they must have spent a lot of money on this around the country, but they said the main achievement was to put a board on the back of scaffold lorries to stop the poles falling off. Well, if that's all they can do, surely we need much more enforcement of these regulations. As the noble lord will know, there are regular spot checks uh, on roads in this country where uh, heavy goods vehicles and indeed other, other vehicles are stopped and checked to make sure that they comply. I will get more information and supply the noble lord with the effectiveness of these spot checks and how often they are carried out. My lords, uh, I have direct experience when I was a member of the European Parliament of uh, a constituent whose daughter was killed uh, by a lorry because the visibility from that lorry was not adequate. 
And I think that changes have been made in relation to the requirements for extra mirrors uh, for observation uh, around a vehicle of that kind. But uh, would I, uh, can I ask my noble friend, um, sometimes the outside mirrors are themselves obstructed with debris or in the use of the vehicle become useless, frankly. And I would like to ask him whether we are sufficiently able to move on to, to actually to do things quickly when we find that there are new ways in which we can help to protect those who are in contact with or close to heavy goods vehicles. My noble friend is quite right. The UK played a leading role in changing international standards. And in July uh, 26, 2016, measures for larger HGVs with improved mirrors came into effect largely as a result of our intervention. Uh, more work is now going on on what they call detec detection technology uh, to detect vulnerable road users and uh, more measures using cameras. And there'll be new requirements for buses and lorries which could come into effect in 2021 20, uh, under the Direct Vision Standards Initiative. I, I don't really understand the Noble Lord Minister's reply. Um, be, um, to, to, to the noble lady, Lady Gardner, because you said the government's focusing on other measures. What other measures? I just don't find it acceptable that you're saying either or. In fact, this is a simple change the government could make, and it could potentially save lives or life-changing injuries. The noble lady didn't understand my reply. What I hope I said was that cement mixers are not exempt. In other words, cement mixers have to comply with the side guard regulations. Uh, since 2012, all new Tippers have to be fitted with side guards. We are taking other measures. On November the 22nd, we published uh, proposals to increase road safety for cyclists, for pedestrians, and for horse riders. There's a wide range of initiatives that the government is taking to promote road safety. Our roads are amongst the safest in the world, but one casualty is one casualty too many. The death of cyclists in this uh, scenario is a, a, a tragedy. Um, but the problem is, as I think you, the Noble Lords alluded to, is that the vehicles are very heavy and the cyclists are very light. And side guards are relatively ineffective uh, when turning left over a prone cyclist. So you, the, the, the modern technology available, including on modestly priced cars of uh, radar systems, sensing systems and so on, powering alerts, uh, are here and available today. They're actually on the car I own. Is the uh, department taking direct action to accelerate the uh, trialling of this sort of equipment on lorries and contemplating regulations to require it be, to be fitted? Mm. Um, we're, we're playing our role uh, in this case along with the uh, European Commission. In May 2018, direct vision for trucks was one of the safety measures included in the European Commission's review of general safety regulations. And we're also supporting measures under the European Commission's third mobility package to further improve the protection of pedestrians and cyclists. And the European Commission is also doing work, which we support, to uh, reduce what they call the aggressiveness of HGV vehicle fronts in the context of vulnerable road users. So the Noble Lord is quite right. There's a, a lot of work going on, supported by the UK, which we hope will improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists. Lord Brooke of Alverthorpe. <coughs> Lord, I beg leave to ask the question, standing my name on the audit paper. My Lords, Public Health England and the BBC are both firmly committed to working together on childhood obesity. Since July, the teams have met three times for discussions and are currently working on the detail of future plans. Uh, grateful to hear that there have been three meetings since we met in July. Um, unfortunately, the latest statistics relating to obesity in children aged 12 to 16 shows a further deterioration. It's time that we really got something moving in the form of a national campaign on obesity. The BBC is an important part of playing that. Could he persuade his Minister, his Secretary of State, to lean on the BBC and Public Health England and to get a move on to so we can start to see programmes being introduced and then to issue a Chapter 3 in the Obesity Plan to incorporate that into it? 
Well, I, I do agree with the noble lord uh, uh, about the importance of the issue, and I'm grateful to him as well for the role that he's played in um, uh, bringing that relationship together, which of course does exist. He knows very well that the BBC has played a critical role over decades in many very important health campaigns, HIV, the Just Say No campaign on drugs. Um, the BBC is absolutely committed. Of course, it would be inappropriate for ministers to lean on the BBC, which has editorial independence that I'm sure we're all anxious to protect. But um, they are committed to doing more. I have to say they, they, there are a number of uh, activities they, that, that they are doing through their programming, the Blue Peter Cooking Club, various CBBC programmes and so on. So I don't think anyone doubts their commitment to this and we will be seeing the fruits of that sh soon, I'm sure. My Lords, is the uh, Noble Lord the Minister aware that food economists have calculated that calorie for calorie, uh, fruit and vegetables and high quality proteins are much more expensive than foods that are high in carbohydrate and fat. So is it surprising that poor parents find that they have to fill up their children with those foods, which eventually often leads to obesity? Now, um, the structural problem underpinning this problem is, of course, poverty. And this is a much wider issue than that of his own department. Of course, it should be a whole government issue. Could he say what the government is doing about that? I uh, absolutely recognise the, the problem that the noble lady has pointed out. And in fact, if you look at um, uh, obesity, childhood obesity, the prevalence doubles between the uh, most deprived and the least deprived areas, and the government is committed to reducing that deprivation gap. Of course, the government is taking a, a very broad range of actions to combat poverty, none more so than making sure that everybody has the chance to work, which is why we have more people in employment than has ever been the case. My Lords, my Lords. Um, following up from that point, yes, in uh, over a quarter of year six children in the most deprived areas are now obese, and this is versus just 11 per cent in our richest communities. Uh, we cannot, poorer people cannot afford the government to eat well paid. So I'd like to ask the government what they are going to do post-Brexit, because every document I have read has promised either 4 per cent or up to 20 per cent rises in food prices. Not one has said food will get cheaper, and we already know we have a deep problem here. So what is the government doing to supply or help either through early start or through subsidising fruit and vegetable consumption or through doctor prescribing to ensure that poorer children can get the, the food they need to ensure that they don't, let's look at it economically, do not become a time bomb for us later on. The noble lady is quite right about the scale of the problem and I think it is worth pointing out that obesity and overweight issues cost the NHS alone £5 billion pounds a year. So that is the scale of the problem. I think uh, there are two parts to the answer. Firstly, of course, the government is ma uh, making sure that there are plans in place to ensure a continuity of food supply uh, as we leave the European Union, whatever uh, the outcome of the negotiations. And I think secondly to her, her, her key points, there are, there are two aspects to it. Firstly, at breakfast clubs, there is a, about £26 million going into breakfast clubs as a result of the sugar levy. And of course, free fruit and veg is available to young children in primary school. With um, a major ITV and VegPA uh, new initiative with them teaming up, uh, they're launching a major initiative in the new year designed to appeal to children as well as a uh, public health initiative through its programme. Uh, would my noble friend agree that the BBC and all the other broadcasters could look at similarly in, uh, imaginative ways of, of uh, bringing these through their programmes? I think that's a, an excellent suggestion. I was looking at the uh, Veg Power campaign, uh, which is an ITV campaign to promote uh, the eating of vegetables before uh, this debate. It looks like an excellent campaign. I think ITV has demonstrated its commitment and certainly shows an example to other broadcasters. The British Irish Parliamentary Assembly produced a report some months ago on childhood obesity covering all the jurisdictions which are represented. I wonder if, could, uh, if I could ask the Minister to have another look at that because there are a number of issues that came out. For example, the need for local authorities to take action, the need for action in schools, and the need for action in the voluntary sector. And I wonder if the Minister could come back when he's looked at it to see what further action could be taken on those recommendations. I should certainly be happy to do so, and I think it is worth pointing out that that document and others have informed the Chapter 2 of the Government's Obesity Strategy that was published recently, which actually, because the problem, as we know, is not yet being dealt with and we have an ambition to halve obesity, we are determined to act on things like banning promotions of sugary foods and also res further restricting advertising. Is the Minister aware of the report in the BBC News today 
that uh, information has been provided that uh, 600 calories is a decent meal. Fast food uh, providers are providing 750 or so on average, but chains of, uh, of uh, chain, chain food suppliers, 1,500 calories. So what's, what's government going to do to encourage those providers to provide lower calorie option meals for the public and for young people, children? I think that is a, Noble, uh, Lord makes a, an excellent point, and that is why in the chapter two that I mentioned, we um, are going to we, uh, propose mandating consistent calorie labelling in out-of-home settings. Indeed, the consultation of that has just closed and we'll be publishing our results shortly. Baroness Wheeler. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the Government is determined to recruit and retain the staff that the health and social care sectors need. This will include a robust domestic recruitment drive, as well as making sure EU staff, who play such an important role in caring for and supporting patients, are able to stay in this country. That is why on Monday, the 3rd of December, we launched the EU Settlement Scheme pilot for the EU workforce in health and social care. I thank the Minister for his response. My Lords, while the Cavendish report makes for alarming reading on the current and potential staff shortages across all the key health and social care professions and shows how dependent we are on the work and dedication of EU nationals, can I focus on social care workers? What's the Minister's response to the Government's Migration Advisory Committee, which says that these vital staff fall into the category of low skill and therefore don't merit preferential rights here in any post-Brexit scenario? In the past, he's acknowledged the skilled, caring jobs these staff do in community services, people's homes, in nursing homes and care homes. Does he agree they're definitely not low skilled? Can he tell the House what he's doing to convince the MAC otherwise? And what's the strategy for recruiting the 130,000 new social care workers we need each year just to stand still, let alone address the future demands of the service? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I th uh, uh, thank the noble lady for her question. I mean, first of all, we want to make sure that those EU uh, staff uh, who are working in Britain are able to do so. And, of course, that is why um, the EU settlement scheme pilot is so important. Um, uh, we are um, in this country that the, the social care workforce has increased a lot, a mixture of domestic and uh, foreign staff, and one of the ways that we are increasing that is attractiveness as a uh, profession is by increasing the living wage, uh, which is, has been of benefit to so many staff in social care. Of course, many of them are highly skilled, uh, and we want to make sure that, that, uh, that they continue to be able to attract such skilled staff. And of course, we continue to discuss with the Home Office exactly what the right thresholds are for our future immigration system, so that we do not lose out on these kind of stuff. Lords, I wonder if the noble lord would agree that uh, the problem is caused primarily because of the low esteem that is given to social care staff. And this is extraordinary because most people, uh, when they find themselves in a dependent position upon these staff, value their contribution enormously. Wouldn't it be helpful if the government actually attached greater importance to these staff, both in terms of reward and in terms of training and proper support? Yeah. 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 The, the noble lord is, is absolutely right, and I would, I would uh, point that the government certainly does not hold them in, in low esteem, quite the opposite. We need to think increasingly, as we know, of health and care staff as one workforce to make sure that there are professional paths that lead through all of them. Um, uh, he will be aware, I'm sure, of the, the work being done by Skills for Care, uh, which provides uh, the overarching policy in this area, which is not only providing, uh, uh, has made recommendations about pay and helped inform our increase in the living wage, but is also providing better training facilities for those staff. My lords, my lords, my lords, um, in addition, my lords, my lords, my lords, in addition to the report um, that, that, that's been referred to, Quorum have today published their annual survey confirming that there is not enough care available for older people, with only one in five local authorities reporting enough care in their area to meet demand. And as a result, over 4.3 million people aged 75 and over are living in an area where there isn't enough social care. The Minister talks about discussions going on with the Home Office, but we've also seen in the report that there was a big peak of leavers from the EU with a big drop in reduction of nurses, dentists, allied health care workers coming in from the EU. This is a perfect storm, my lords. So when will the Home Office please understand there is a range of staff we need in this country? And secondly, can the Minister confirm when the Government's paper on health and social care will be published? Um, 
to the noble lady's point, of course, care needs uh, are increasing, and that's a, a fact uh, that, that flows from having a, a growing and ageing population. I should point out that the government has increased funding available for social care by over £9 billion over three years uh, uh, in recent budgets. Um, so we do recognise the seriousness of this issue. Um, we, of course, want to retain those staff. I think it's good to see that there are more EU staff in the NHS today than there, or in June 2018 than there were in June 2016, and we want them to stay. Um, and as for the social green paper, that will be coming out shortly. My lords, my lords, my lords um, I'm very grateful to the noble minister for the value that he places on those working in the social care and health sector. Um, but the National Institute of Economic Social Research identifies that that sector is under considerable pressure, even before we consider Brexit. The Royal College of Nursing say that fewer nurses started training in our universities this year. 15% of all our vacancies, 15% um, of all our nursing roles have vacancies in London. Past experience tells us that recruitment is complex. I wonder whether the noble minister can reassure the House that in a, an environment that uses the language of taking back our borders and controlling immigration, that steps are being taken to reassure, reassure not just those within the EU, EU, but outside the EU, that they remain a valued and essential part of our diverse health and social care sector. Grateful to the right Reverend Prelate for the opportunity to say uh, that every single person who works in this country in these professions is valued by us. Um, uh, we may want to make sure they're able to stay and able to contribute to the health and wealth of our country. Um, I just point out that one of the ways that we are improving the situation of both recruitment and retention is not only um, in the increases in the living wage, but also changes to the Agenda for Change pay deal that was concluded earlier this year, which will bring about a million staff, at least a 3% pay increase by the end of 2018-19, and will also increase the starting salary of a nurse by nearly 10% uh, to 24, nearly £25,000 by 2021. My Lords, could, could my noble friend um, ensure that the, the, the living wage we all value is an increased wage, but we don't get, as a provider of social care, and my, my interests are in the register, what I would ask the government if they could do is get ring fencing done for the extra funding that the government rightly does put into social care so that local authorities have to pass that on to providers because whilst we have increases in cost, we cannot pass that on to our care workers simply because providers just cannot <coughs> afford it. I do recognise the picture that my noble friend paints. It is, of course, incredibly important that money does get to the front line. Um, I would point to her, and I'm sure she's well aware of it, about the, the operation of the Better Care Fund which is bringing together local authority and NHS funding specifically to support social care provision. And that, the, the amounts of money going through that have been increasing over the recent years. Lord West. Statistics quoted by my noble friend on the front bench are pretty frightening. But the knock-on effect on the 6.5 million unpaid carers on whom our health and social care system depends are even more alarming. In a recent survey, 70% of them doubted their ability to continue caring if more support, much of which comes from these care workers, were not available to them. Will the Minister assure the House that the forthcoming Green Paper, which we know is imminent, and the NHS plan will take full account of the needs of carers? Well, I'm grateful to the noble lady uh, for uh, raising the matter and her persistence in always doing so. She's quite right, too. Um, we were pleased, of course, to, to publish the action plan earlier in the year, and uh, I can tell her that the Green Paper, uh, as I have said before at this dispatch box, will contain, contain more uh, policy on supporting carers. Lord West of Spithead. Last question, standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, HS2 Limited regularly review project plans and are currently working with their contracted suppliers to update and agree their latest cost and schedule confidence assessments for Phase 1. HS2 Limited are always examining lessons learnt from major infrastructure projects, including Crossrail, to improve their understanding of the risks to delivering on time and to budget. We will publish updated cost and schedule estimates for Phase 1 as part of the full business case in 2019. I thank the Noble Lord for his answer. It is a huge amount of money involved. Um, there is not much money around, and things have changed. Can I ask the, uh, the noble lord, um, does he think that increasing capacity on the West Coast main line is more important than 
for example, sorting out the shambles in the civil nuclear industry, thereby safeguarding our future energy supplies um, for the nation? Does he think it's more important than getting a secure GPS system to replace Galileo, from which we were so disgracefully excluded by the EU? Does he think it's more important than resolving the funding crisis in our armed forces at a time that Russia is confronting and destabilising our nation? If not, don't you think there's a time that we should pause and reconsider maybe where this money should be spent? Well, um, the noble lord will know that a uh, question about the allocation of resources between a range of government departments is one taken collectively by the Cabinet and announced by the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the appropriate time. It is not a matter for a junior minister uh, to, <laughs> to, 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 comment, to comment on the allocation of public expenditures between the Ministry of Defence, Transport, Energy and a whole range of departments. On, on, on the last part of his question, I think it is right to go ahead with this uh, project. Uh, it is expensive, but uh, the, f the Phase 1 funding has not increased since the spending review settlement in 2015. Phase 1 is scheduled to cross $27.18 billion in 2015 prices, and we are determined to keep it within that cost estimate. Much respected and much liked former Secretary of State as well as uh, junior <laughs> minister in your Lordship's house. Comment at least on the prioritisation of railway needs and demands. He will have noted following the resignation of Sir Terry Morgan that the Mayor of Liverpool resigned last week from the board of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, citing as his reason for doing so the lack of rail investment to service the £1 billion renaissance of Liverpool dockside. Can he say where HS3 and the proposed linkage of northern cities now stands? Shouldn't the right revitalisation of the north be a much higher priority than HS2 that by comparison will contribute far less to northern regeneration? <coughs> well, the, the, the Noble Lord makes a, a powerful case for more resources uh, for transport in addition to the money which we have already committed to uh, HS2, both Phase 1 and Phase 2. Uh, he wants additional resources to improve connectivity with Liverpool. There is a spending review which is just starting, in which, case, in which I'm sure the Department of Transport and those departments would have an interest of the Northern Powerhouse will be making bids. And I note the strong representations from the Noble Lord that improved connectivity for Liverpool should be a high priority. You can read the reports from the Economic Affairs Committee of this House on HS2. And could he just um, confirm how many billions could be saved by a marginal reduction in the speed of this train. <laughs> Can I write to my noble friend <laughs> uh, with the answer to, to that question? What, what, what is happening at the moment, as I indicated in my first reply, is there is a dialogue between uh, HS2 and the suppliers in order to ensure that the bids come in within the overall envelope that the government has uh, allocated. And this may indeed involve looking at some of the uh, specifications that my noble friend has referred to, because we are determined to stick within that uh, uh, envelope. And all options will be looked at in order to uh, uh, make sure that we maintain the costs of this project. Um, from the National Infrastructure Commission uh, thinks that Crossrail uh, that HS2 could cost an additional £43 billion. Pounds. Is it not time yeah, that the yeah. government gave us an update, yeah, yeah. up to date estimate of the true cost yes. of this Please plan? Please. And does the government accept that the north of England needs better east west rail yeah. connections yeah. as yeah. much as it needs? HS2 going all the way to the north and not stopping at Birmingham. Yeah. Um, as, as I said in my original reply, we will publish updated cost estimates as part of the full business case in 2019 to answer the first part of the noble lady's question. On, on the second part, she has reinforced the bid for more resources to go into public transport in the north. That has been noted and will be taken up in the spending review. Could I uh, uh, say on, on behalf, I'm sure, of the whole House that we would welcome the Noble Lord's appointment as Secretary of State for Transport yeah. so he can take yeah. 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 
for these issues, and we think he might be a great improve, improvement on the current, on the current regime. Yeah. Uh, could, could I also say, in respect of, uh, of, of HS2 and HS3, nice. my lords, it is vitally important that we improve intercity connectivity between London, the Midlands and the North. It is also vitally improvement that we improve connectivity between the northern cities. And, my lords, we should not have to choose between them. So would the Noble Lord agree that the right thing to do is to proceed with HS2 and HS3, and if we weren't having to spend £39 billion on Brexit, then we could do both very comfortably? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My Lord, you don't see one Transport Secretary for a long time, and then two come along <laughs> at once. <laughs> um, the, 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 the Noble Lord is right. Uh, HS2 will directly connect eight of the ten largest cities in the country. It is about connectivity and capacity as much as about uh, speed. He has reinforced the strong bid I have already heard, uh, and uh, reinforced by him, for more resources to HS3 and other connectivity within the cities of the north. That bid will be taken forward as part of the spending review, and the added weight the Noble Lord has uh, just given to that will, I'm sure, cut a lot of ice in the Treasury. 